uh, I think I'm going to dig a bit more detail in what the things that uh, Dick said. So my name is Michiel Teisling. I've worked, I've been working 33 years for Dow Chemical, uh, about half of it in the automation arena. Um, right now I'm located in Houston uh, for since six years, and uh, originally I come from Tunisia. So you can see here a couple of um, things on the slide. One of it is growing the future together. So why do I talk about process automation and, and, and projects? Well, six years ago, uh, Dow started a major initiative to invest in the Gulf Coast area to use the shale gas. Shale gas is a very advantage steep feedstock. So we decided to invest heavily in the Gulf Coast area uh, and then basically supporting uh, Dow's future growth. Um, if you talk about projects, what I call a major project is anything. Okay. Is this better? Okay. Thank you for the adjustment. Um, so, what is a major project from my perspective? Is everything above hundred million dollars? Um, Smaller, of course, if 90, is that a major project? Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, if it's just kind of an expansion. Um, and what does process automation mean here? Well, the system that you need to start up, run the plant and shut it down safely and also optimize it. So that's kind of at a high level. So Dow has invested uh, now $7 billion over uh, 14 plants and I'm going to share a couple of thoughts about that. This is uh, Lata Compass 9. It's, the, it's located in Texas, um, Freeport. And everything in Texas is what? Big. Huge. So it's the biggest, yep. So it's, uh, it's our largest cracker that we operate, and it is close to being the largest cracker in, in, the, in the world. And if you look at the picture in detail, you see, you know, cars and you can see how those cars are extremely small. This picture was taken with a drone at uh, 300 feet. Um, you can see you know the stacks of the furnaces uh, on the left hand side you know are almost on the same height. Uh, the, those are 270 feet. So this gives you a bit of a, an idea about the size of the plant. The white buildings in the middle, or the gray buildings as you say, that's the cover for the compressors. So you start at the furnaces with your feet, so go through the compression section, and then you go to the columns on the right, which is the separation section. So this, is, uh, this process has been around for quite a long time, and now you, know, you have to kind of automate that uh, in a smart way, right? And this is not one of the plants, it's one of the many plants. The scope was 60,000 I.O. divided over uh, 14 plants, four uh, brownfields, as Dick indicated, and 10 uh, grassroots. So two very diverse groups of, uh, of projects. And then there are about 140 engineers working on this effort. And for a period longer than five years, and I'll explain a bit more about that. And so if you think about how to set goals for such a group, right? what is it that we want out of this group? Now think about what you've heard and seen the last two days here. You know, open process automation, cybersecurity, optimization, and da 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 da. It's very attractive to you know, stuff a lot of new thoughts and new ideas into this project, right? Um, and you know, because Doing it you know, like a project like 20 years ago doesn't look attractive at such a point. Despite all those things, we have actually only two major goals. One is about quality. One is making sure that the uh, interlock system that we have will install is basically without any doubt. So basically it's complete, audited and validated in the field. And the other one is that we have no errors in the software, no bugs uh, that impact the operational performance. The other one is schedule. Um, we want to make sure that we stay off the critical path of a project. So basically, we're not on the critical path, but also if we get close to the critical path, uh, that we have an effective way of resolving that. 
So just a sh short question here. How many people of you are involved now in doing major projects? Okay. So uh, I'm interested in your, some of your questions. So there's one third item that is not mentioned here. Which one is that? If you look at a project, there's always schedule, quality, and what else is there? Cost. Why did I mention it? Why is it not on here? Hmm? Pick two. Yep, that's one. And why would I choose these two and not cost? Think about that. I want these two, but you know, clearly, but if, suppose if I would take cost as a main driver, right? Either schedule or quality has to suffer. Well, if quality suffers, schedule will suffer. So basically, it means that the plant will be down while it's ready to start up. Think about the impact of that. If you keep a cracker that the size that I just showed down for you know two weeks, I've exceeded my automation budget already a couple of times. That's the impact that it has if you cannot run such a plant. So hence, you know, I always kind of tell my project managers, you know, fantastic, you know, do you want to talk about cost? I'm not interested. It's only 1% of your total budget, as Dick indicated. But, you know, I have the power to really keep your plan down. So let's not talk too long about it. And most of them have accepted that. So, okay, so the, the story here is, you know, there's a lot of technical questions, and you know, Dick shared some of those with you, that, that you have to answer. Many, you know, how do I communicate with these devices? How do I organize this? Where do I get the resources from? Where do I build my stuff? Da, 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 da. And I'm the automation leader, so actually I'm accountable for all that stuff. There's a lot of questions and there's no way I can answer all those questions. So the trick to doing such a program of 14 projects is basically organizing it well. And by organizing it well, you will be able to uh, execute it effectively. So this is kind of uh, the starting point, and also they shared, hey, where do you start? Do you start with a blank sheet of paper, then throw everything that you know from the past away, or uh, do you use some of it, right? And what can you use? So you, you talk about resources, people have worked in projects before, you talk about your suppliers, uh, you know, who are your suppliers and how can they contribute to your plant? Your best practices, what do you know work well, and how are you going to move it forward, and then the opportunities. And at the end of a project, and you know, we're almost in the completion side uh, time of, of the program, you again get resources, you get you know, your new list of suppliers, your new list of best practices, and then you know, some of the opportunities. So I'm going to talk a bit about the four items, and you can see it spans six years. Six years. Can you imagine working six years on only one effort? You know, for most of it, it's far too long. So that's something that is, you have to take into mind. So the legacy basically is a result achieved by many. Uh, I'm only, you know, one small portion of it. So, uh, uh, so if you look at uh, the people, if there's anything I want you to remember from this presentation, forget all the technical stuff, be cognizant of one factor, and that's the people factor. All the questions that you have, all those details, they will have to be answered by people, right? The, the people who work on it, the 140 people we're talking about. So it's, you know, such a program is a great opportunity to develop automation talent, but it's also a good opportunity for growing leaders. And so new leaders that basically, and, and, and stretch them a bit, so that you have future automation leads as well. And so if you think about the automation lead, how do we recognize a good automation lead for, for instance, for a cracker? You know, 10,000 I.O., how do we know that this person can do it? You know, I look at the CV. Well, that doesn't tell me a whole lot. So typically what I look at, and, and the organization uh, uh, looks at, is you know, three things. You know, for a lead, of course, you need to have proven leadership skills. Plus, you work in the technology producing ethylene, so you want the person also to have experience in that same technology. And experience means that, yes, you did some automation there, you understand the, the flow sheet, and understand some of the uh, uh, technology. Last but not least, you need to understand the platform. So our standard platform is ABB 800SA, so you want that person to be very familiar with the platform, the opportunities, the limitations, etc. So that's how you choose basically, you know, you're, I had 10 leads and those 10 leads are organized in, in a kind of a leads team that, you know, 
processes all those decisions. And if you have 140 people, what do you think? All star performers? Fantastic people, you know? No. You will have the average distribution, so you have people that will do real well, and you will do peop have people that basically will be average or even below average. And so when we selected quite a few of those people, there was you know, one person that I gave high mark, I got highly recommended, um, and uh, he joined our team, and he started working, and you know, the lead said, yeah, I'm not so sure. He doesn't really perform as we expected. So that's kind of a bummer, because you know, he came highly recommended from a leader that I respected. So what is going on over here? And I found a trick when we did, uh, had an issue with one of our installations, and there was a Profibus, deep, uh, Profibus issue, and we needed to go to the MCC to look at that, say, hey, can I join you guys? Yeah, sure. And he joined us, and he became very passionate when he saw the hardware and when we started looking in, into the issue. It, his affinity was with hardware and solving issues around that area. So guess what we did after that? We moved him into that hardware uh, area. So basically, he became our focal point for foreign devices. And I can tell you, man, he, he did everything that, and, and even a whole lot more. He set some standards for that that we're going to use in the future. So, so you have to kind of manage you know, the, the group of people that you have, 140 people. You will have, that, have to recognize you know, your talent and basically employ them as such. The other thing is uh, suppliers. So we, you know, the list of suppliers that we have for automation is not very long. Uh, ABB is one of them. Uh, Maverick is another. Um, and then we have uh, suppliers outside the US, uh, like Steady Argus. And you have to kind of work with them. And so one of the things that we have to do is build 400 cabinets for our DCS system, right? So you know, most people get very creative. Build it in India, lower cost. Okay, build it in Thailand. Okay, even lower cost. So you start thinking, well, you know, building your hardware somewhere so far away, it's not really what I had in mind. You know, getting on a plane every month and visit my hardware, uh-uh, let's not do that. So we asked uh, ABB to work with us. You know, can we find a cabinet builder, you know, locally here in, in, in the Houston area? So we did all that and da 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 da, and lo and behold, we found one that we thought was you know, a good fit. So we had a checklist of things, and ABB did some pre-screening, and we did the final screening, and yep, good to go. Well, you need some luck once in a while as well, I can tell you that. You know Houston, uh, we had Harvey last year. The year before, we had you know, tropical rainstorms, and it may not have crossed your mind, but large portions of Houston were flooded. One of the areas that got flooded was, yep, where our cabinet builder was. So I called when I heard that you know, Tom Ball was flooded. I said, hey guys, how are you doing? He said, well, we're doing pretty well, no flooding. It came very close, a couple of inches, but it didn't get. And the reason why they didn't flood is because the city had an ordinance that every, if you own so much acreage, you need to build a pond to hold water. And every business has done it in that area, so they had holding ponds for water. So that prevented them from actually flooding. So that's kind of the luck that you sometimes need to have. Uh, but that's it. And they're, they're basically one of our fixed suppliers going, in, uh, going forward. So and you have to kind of really take this opportunity to re revisit the list of suppliers as such. Now, the other thing, and, and you have been walking around here, and you may get very ambitious about all the new opportunities that are in the automation space, right? Now think about a cracker, more than $2 billion investment, and you're going to do some new things over there, completely new, never proven and shown before. Yeah, you get many supporters, uh, or not, no. So you have to really choose very wisely how to improve your stuff. You need to improve, because remember, you know, a seven year period, you cannot, you know, you know that when you're at the end of that period, you have a new generation of automation systems. So you have to carefully select those items that you like to improve. Um, so what we did is we piloted innovations and basically we had 20 chartered efforts. So basically a chartered effort is you give it to somebody who can work on it with a green group of people and those group of people were typically selected from other projects uh, that were on our program. And so that we immediately kind of spread the knowledge to the other teams. So we had uh, 20 chartered efforts, 18 of them basically were successful, two basically we stopped because they were not too promising. 
But at the end, uh, we had quite a few, I think, new things that you know will take forward going uh, will, will take going forward. And of course, you know, uh, the, the best practice that we started with, you know, was our uh, hardware platform, you know, some of our libraries uh, and how we do our uh, automation uh, uh, projects so all, and how we track our projects. Did we have any failures? What do you think? Five years, six years, 140 people, 14 projects. Did we have any failures? Of course not, no. Yes, we had a couple. So part of that organization is also when you run into something like that. So one of the projects basically run basically on a coral reef and didn't get go forward, didn't go backwards anymore. And basically in their boat was, you know, metaphorically leaking lots of water. So we had to kind of intervene and do some stuff. And the only way you can do that if you're well positioned to do that. So you have to organize your effort well so that you know you can execute effectively. Do we have some new opportunities? Well, if you walk around today, I think you know that answer is definitely yes. Um, connecting your I/O to uh, the DCS system, you know, from wireless to something else, uh, mobile devices. Uh, think about virtual controllers, etc. So I think you know, yes, there are still some uh, new opportunities, but again, you have to charter that and, and pilot those uh, as such. And you can see here, organizing it well helped us to execute effectively. Okay, so last slide, guys. Um, this is uh, one of the projects. This is one of the Brownfield projects. I sh shared uh, nine um, with you. This is uh, the two pictures above. It's the old control room, and you recognize it most likely. Yeah? A hotspot, a whole kind of system, uh, screens, and da 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 da. And it, it was a mess. It was a good old mess, you know. The fact that operators could work their safety said more about the operators than about you know how well we designed it. And basically, we took two weeks, gutted the control room, and basically put a new control room in place. And you can see the uh, EOWs that uh, are visible, and uh, you can see it's completely different atmosphere, very light, etc. So we had one of our executives. Um, coming to visit this plant, LP2, um, and he walked in into the back room door, of, and uh, he, he put, poked his head in and said, "I'm looking for LP2 guys, uh, but this is not it, right? I'm at the wrong location, but I remember it being here. But this looks so different; it cannot be it." Well, the operator said, "Welcome to our new control room. Yes, this is different, but you're at the right location." So it shows, you know, this is not a kind of migration, this was really a transformation. And I think, how did we do that? I think, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, organizing it well uh, helped us to make this uh, go effectively. So what did I do during this whole period? Not a whole lot. Um, basically, uh, stay back as much as possible from the teams and help them when needed and intervening when necessary. And remember, you know, automation is only 1% of the total cost of a large program only 1%. So they dwarf you pretty quickly. So you need to make sure that you're with your colleagues from construction and engineering and what have you and commissioning a startup, you main good contact and basically push back necessarily. Because then somebody gets a question, well, we want to start up this piece of equipment uh, three months earlier. You can deliver, right? Well, no. This is the schedule we adhere to, but let's talk about opportunities. But so that's kind of also again, you know, organizing uh, that well. Okay, um, I think if you have any burning questions, we can ask them right now. Otherwise, I think Dick is going to continue with uh, 